Good evening, everyone. Today's Monday, June 12th, and I'm Melanie Morris, and you know who I am. I'm known as that lady in the yellow jacket. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Remember, I'm here every Monday night at 7.30, so don't miss my show. And this show will re-air tomorrow, Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. And tonight's topic is something that's really, really important. It's something that's happening in every American city, and it's happening right here in Boston. Unsolved murders, and especially unsolved murders of our young, black and brown men. So my guest tonight is here. She's taken her tragedy and moved it into a movement so that we can get these murders solved. Her name is Mary Franklin, and she is the founder of the Women Survivors of Homicide Movement. They have an event coming up on June 24th, Purple Light Night Walk, and we're gonna talk about the movement and the walk. Thank you so much, Mary, for coming in tonight. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So what is your organization? Well, Women Survivors of Homicide Movement started about three years ago. It was a spinoff from Melvin's Mission, which is a day program. Uh, first of all, my husband, Melvin Bernard Franklin, was murdered October 15, 1996. Uh, and it's still unsolved. And that story, it's a tragedy, of course, but it is not original. There are hundreds and hundreds of um, black men in the city of Boston whose crimes are literally sitting in file cabinets in the Boston Police Department. But Women Survivors of Homicide Movement is the activist piece of uh, women coming together in poor communities, uh, who have something in common. We've all lost someone to the tragedy of homicide. And uh, we've decided to be their voices, to speak up for these people who, whose lives were taken senselessly and uh, to advocate that their crimes might be solved one day. So I'm very sorry to, about your husband's Thank death. You. I do want to say that. Thank very, you. very sorry. I've read Thank about you. it in some of the clips on, on uh, the internet and yes. it's just, it's just horrific, just Thank a horrific um, incident. So what now, what are you trying to do or how are, how are you getting the police's attention so that they can work on these homicides? Yeah. Well, I think um, we've done a great job and I credit a lot of the women who work with me in the organization. Uh, you know, we've really been able to bring attention to this issue. Uh, for the past three years, uh, we, we've done a lot of work around witness protection. It was uh, Women Survivors of Homicide Movement that was the organization uh, that pushed for triple funding for witness protection program. We worked very closely with District Attorney, Suffolk County District Attorney Dan Conley. We've uh, done numerous billboard uh, campaigns to bring attention to the matter. We uh, did a sit-in at the uh, headquarters of the Boston Police Department for 30 days, literally living in the lobby of headquarters to say, listen, these crimes have been in existence for decades. And when are we really going to take this serious and look at it as an ec epidemic? Because that's what it really is. So let's talk about the witness program. You know, there's word on the street, or at least from what I've read, that, you know, there's this no snitch policy. Mm -hmm. Is a witness program uh, helping with the no snitch policy? Well, I think when you talk about the witness protection program in the no snitch policy, you have to look at the fact that witness protection uh, needs to be modified. You know, there's data that we have, and this is so true, that when you look at the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office versus uh, District Attorney's Office um, in another county that's more affluent, you will find that Suffolk County uh, spends approximately, let's say, $1,000 per witness, where other communities would spend double or triple that amount of money. So my issue would be this, and this is something I speak with to uh, Dan Conley about, um, on occasions. We have to step up. Witness protection has to be quality. We have to really, really meet the needs of these citizens to ensure that um, they're willing and able to speak up and then protect them, um, that they can uh, help these families to get these murders solved. You know, I'm big on this, Melody, the fact that 
we have to understand that though uh, we live in these poor communities, violent communities, we have responsibility also as families um, to, to step up and engage in our communities and to ask people to please find a way. If you have information, speak up. If you know something about a crime, help a family out by uh, uh, finding a safe way to get that information delivered to law enforcement. Is, is that information well received when you're out um, spreading that? I'll be honest with you, no. And, and whose fault really is that? You know, we have to build relationships with our law enforcement and black communities. Um, you know, Commissioner Evans will say a lot, uh, Boston Police Department is the most diverse uh, uh, police department. Uh, the, 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 you know, the command staff is, you know, full of uh, minorities and, and women. But, you know, I'll beg the difference. That might be true. But what is the relationship in these communities with our police department? You know, um, the police department has just put out an ice cream truck and uh, officers play ball, basketball with our youth. You know, that's fine and good, but we have to go beyond that. What, how are we building real relationships? And now, is that something that your organization is also trying to help with? That police? is one of the uh, things that we do, uh, uh, do. And that comes again with um, having events. It comes with the billboard campaigns. It also comes with meeting with homicide detectives and district attorneys and uh, elected officials to let them know that this is a new day and time, that survivors are standing up. Survivors are speaking up because we want these murder songs. Now, are they on board? Are they are they receptive? Well, you will have, um, you know, different feelings around it. You know, there's times there's resistance and other things like that. But I would say 75% uh, of the time we're able to get along. We're able to sit down and have productive conversations. But I'm not going to fool you here. There are times we definitely go head to head um, and we bump heads on issues and um, different initiatives. Wow, 75 percent of the time. So let's talk about the number of homicides that are unsolved approximately. Well, about uh, three years ago, uh, two years ago, I um, went to the police department and I requested some information. So I started from 1970 to 2015. I wanted it, a list of, I wanted the data of every person that was murdered in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan within that time span. So we were looking at four decades. You will not believe there are over a thousand. When I got this information, we went through it, my organization and Over I. Over 1,000 unsolved? Unsolved. Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. So we're not wow. talking about Boston as a whole right. or the state of Massachusetts. Right. We're talking about three of the poorest and violent communities in our city. We found, as we went through this data, that a lot of these murders, um, there were inconsistencies in the data. There's a gentleman in here. Uh, they have him registered as a woman. He was murdered 30 years ago, and they have him as a female. So my question is this, how many years has the police department been looking for a murdered woman when it really is a murdered man? Uh, even in this list, some people have two murder scenes. You know, that's ridiculous. I, I, no one can be murdered twice. Um, there's other things in here. Um, Ages might be wrong, races, gender. So we have to really seriously look at this. Here are over a thousand people. Um, is this list so incorrect? Who do we trust? Who, who can we really go to? So is, does Commissioner Evans know this? And what is he trying to do to fix this? Well, one of the things they did, they gave us a new list. It's supposed to be a revised list. Again, I'll beg to differ. <laughs> there are uh, some mistakes there. And there are also victims who are not counted um, in this data. One of the things we do as an organization, daily we meet people. And my question is this, hello, my name's Mary Franklin. Literally, have you ever lost anyone to murder? 90% of the time, the answer is yes. Um, if the conversation is comfortable enough, I'll ask the victim's name, date, date they were, uh, their life was taken, what community. 
And um, we find that so many people are missing from the list. Really? So you've taken this list or this updated list from the police department and you're really on the streets asking people just word of mouth. We're have really lost, trying. Have yeah. you lost a loved one? Yes, we're really trying to correct, correct the data. And that's how you're trying to correct the data. Yes. And what percentage um, are young black and brown men or well, black the, and brown men period? Right. From the list that I have again, which is Roxbury, Dorchester and Mattapan from 1970, um, I would say 90, approximately 90% 90 are black and men of color. But I also say this that the data shows when you look at 1970, you will notice that more white women were being murdered um, in the in the 70s, 80s, mid to late, uh, um, uh, uh, mid to late 80s more white women. But then when you get to the late 80s, early 90s, you'll find black women starting to take over um, that majority of data. So, so yes, it, it's very interesting data. Though, though sad as it is, it's very interesting data. Very interesting data. Now, what about the mayor? Has he weighed in on this? You know, Mayor Walsh, uh, numerous times we've um, had conversation with the mayor. We've talked to the mayor. We've been promised things. Um, you know, we've been promised that you know, unsolved homicides are going to be a major issue. Um, and again, broken promises. You haven't seen that happen. A lot of broken promises. Have you seen any steps towards that? Most promise? definitely. The Boston Police Department has been doing some things to, um, you know, help, I, I believe, um, get started at changing things, but it's not enough. You're talking thousands and thousands and decades and decades of people who were murdered. Um, in, in, in certain sections of the city, and these are poor sections again. Um, these crimes aren't being solved, but when you look at our Boston Police Department and our homicide unit, um, you, you have approximately 70% uh, of the homicide unit that does not reflect the community. And I think that that's a problem. You have to start building relationships around cultural competency. That's real, real important. So what can the police, uh, the Boston police do to better solve these? If you, if you were coaching them, what would you tell them? I mean, can the state police help at all? Yeah, definitely state police can help. When you talk about the state police, any homicides that happen on state property, uh, state police uh, takes over that homicide. And I will say this about our state uh, police, they solve approximately 60% uh, of their crimes. Um, and, and I would think that the Boston police and state, the state police would some, some type of way merge that whatever it is that they're doing, because it's working, that they could share that with the Boston Police Department. We also talked to um, the homicide unit about creating a new cold case team. We have a whole comprehensive plan around this. But again, people have to be willing to do what they say, say what you have to say and mean what you say. Uh, the only way it can be stopped and changed is we have to work together and that's the community and law enforcement. We have to work together with the community yes. and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're just joining us, my guest tonight is Mary Franklin. She's the founder of the Women Survivors of Homicide Movement. And you have an event coming up on June 24th. Right. Let's uh, tell yeah. our viewers out there about your event. Well, we're very excited about it. First of all, we created something called The Circle We Share. Um, and it is a initiative that welcomes police officers, um, activists like myself and others, families who've lost people to murder, elected officials, clergy, veterans, uh, people uh, who've experienced PTSD, everything that is involved with um, the tragedy of homicide. So the circle we share, we've all come together and our kickoff is called the Purple Light Night. I don't know if you know this, but purple is the color chosen for unsolved homicides. Um, so we've called it the Purple Light Night. So we're going to be meeting on Saturday, uh, June 24th at Franklin Park Zoo entrance at 7 o'clock. Families and elected officials, homicide detectives, and everyone that um, has lost someone to murder and that murder's unsolved. We are walking down Blue Hill Avenue um, into Mattapan to the B to the B3, rather, uh, police department. And we are going to raise our unsolved, uh, unsolved homicide flag. We're going to have refreshments. But what's so important about this walk is that it is the kickoff to um, recreating the data. We're going to have a purple table there, and we're going to have families come over and give us new information, updated information. This is how you start it. This is how you build community. And this is how we rectify this problem.
Wow, fantastic, fantastic. Yes. Yeah, that's, that sounds like that's going to be a great event. I'm very excited yeah. about it. Yeah, you very. should be excited. You Thank should be you. excited. You definitely you. should be excited. And as you said, it will give you an opportunity for people who may not know about your organization or may not know, have right. their loved one on the list, right. they'll be able to submit that name mm -hmm. if and, they have lost a loved one. Right, and you also would think something like this, look at decade old homicides. You know, some families have given up on, on these murders. Um, even recent homicides, you know, I talk to families every single day. I talk to women every day. There is so much guilt and shame that comes with, um, living your life after losing someone to murder. And you wouldn't think that, but it is so true. You know, a lot of women feel like, well, Mary, my son was involved in uh, street violence. But my, my message to these women and to these mothers and these wives and is that no one had the right to take their life. That's right. We have a justice system. If you do something wrong, you call the police. No one had that right. And just for that reason alone, you have to fight for your loved one. You have to fight for your murdered child. You know, you have to fight for your murdered husband or wife. You, you have to do it. They do not have a voice. Yeah, and I, I would definitely second that. I, I never thought about it like that. Yes, if you lost a loved one to violence, no matter what they were doing, that has nothing at all to do with their death and their murder. So you should always fight for them, always Definitely. fight for them. And give us the information again. for the Sure, the purple. Uh, purple Light Night Walk is Saturday, June 24th. We're meeting at 7 p.m. in front of the Franklin Park Zoo entrance. And we'll be walking down Blue Hill Avenue, um, you know, police officers, homicide detectives, families, clergy, every, anybody and everybody who cares about these unsolved crimes. And we're, we're going to raise the flag when we get to the Morton Street Mattapan Police Station. We'll have refreshments. And the main thing is that we're going to update this information. We, we, we have to. This is serious. For decades, murders have been sitting. And I mean, look at my situation. Melvin was murdered 20 years ago. I cannot go another decade. It can't be 30 years that his crime is unsolved. Melvin deserves justice, but so does every single person on every one of these pages. They, they were, someone loved them and still loves them today. These are human beings. Someone took their life and that person is either still walking the streets of Boston or they're walking the streets in other um, states and cities or maybe they've lost their lives. But at the end of the day, families want to know why and they want to know who. At the end of the day, families want to know why and who. And speaking of Melvin, uh, I read this piece and I'm just gonna read it here. And let's, sure. let's talk about Melvin okay. and <laughs> learn about Melvin and what type of guy yes. he was. And I just love this. Actually, it was written by Yvonne Abram uh, it's a Boston.com piece from October 2013. Mm -hmm. There are some things Mary Franklin wants you to know about her husband, Melvin. He was a minister, a doting father who never complained, even when he arrived home to find an extra dog to feed or somebody else's child in need of shelter. He was a recording artist who appeared on Soul Train. Welcome five very talented young men from Boston, Massachusetts, as they join us to do their latest single on the Tommy Boy label entitled Cheap Thrills. Put your hands together, please, gang, for Planet Patrol. <laughs> guy who could pull off shiny pink pants in his day. He was a man who made an honest living, catching the bus from his job as a sky cap to the house he was proud to own on Woodrow Avenue. She wants you to know these things so that you don't think of him as just another black man shot to death on a Dorchester street. Because 
unless people think of Melvin Bernard Franklin as a real person, a person with talents and quirks and dreams and loves just like anybody else, she's convinced we'll never find the person who killed him. Tell us about Melvin. Sure, if I could just speak to that latter part, I'm convinced that we'll never find the person that killed Melvin. I'm going to uh, reject that now and erase that now. Yeah, we will find the person who killed Melvin one day. I really, really believe that. Melvin was a wonderful, kind, humble, uh, beautiful black man. He was the best thing that had ever happened to me. He, he was the father of our three children. Uh, he was a working man. Um, he was a God-fearing man. Um, Melvin was everything. And he's, Melvin is worth fighting for. And uh, it was Melvin's murder that has inspired me and hundreds and hundreds of other women to take that opportunity and to dare to stand up and say, this is my loved one, I want their murder solved. So Melvin still lives on today. Yeah, that's who Melvin Bernard Franklin is. Melvin still lives on today. Yes, and I'm, I'm sure he's smiling down on you. Yeah. And he's saying, fight, Mary, yes. fight, Most fight, definitely. fight, 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 fight. Yes. Now, if, with going back to your organization, mm -hmm. if people want to donate or volunteer their time, yes. uh, can they? Sure. Our phone number is 857-600-1623. We also have an active daily Facebook page. It's almost like a reality Facebook page. Everything that goes on um, daily is registered on our page. So if people want to go to Facebook and look up Women Survivors of Homicide Movement, they're more than welcome to. Um, they can connect with us through uh, uh, that venue or again, our number is 857-600-1623. Wonderful. And I've been to their Facebook page and it is very, very active. Mm -hmm. And if you just scroll through, you can read a lot of the stories. Um, you can hear, see some of the heartbreak within the posts that are there. You can read about their events, and their Facebook page is very active. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I would recommend you just visit the Facebook page. You at least get a feel of what we're talking about, what we're talking about mm -hmm. here. Let's go back to the police. Sure. So right now, if the Commissioner Evans were watching, what would you want to tell him? Oh, let me think here. Well, probably I'd want to tell him um, things that I've already told him, which would be, Commissioner Evans, we've talked on numerous occasions, and um, you know, I told you we have to work together. Though you say you're willing, the police department um, is more than happy to do that, that is not what is being shown. So I ask you again, Commissioner Evans, to please, to please sit down with Women Survivors of Homicide Movement. We are the organization in the city of Boston that deals specifically with unsolved homicides. We have ideas, we have initiatives, they're creative and we know that they will work. So I ask you again, allow us to that table. Yeah. We're gonna make sure he sees that. Thank you. Yeah, we'll make sure that he yeah. sees that. It's, we'll very, sure. it's very important, you cannot do it um, unless you're working together. And for three years, that has always been our message. You know, I don't even know what really happened when we first started building this relationship uh, with, let's say, Commissioner Evans. I mean, he, Commissioner Evans had been to our program, oh, six, seven, eight times, sat at, sat at our table. Um, you know, we went back and forth on issues. No one's going to agree on everything. But sometimes you have to agree to disagree, and that's okay. But to literally slam the door, not close it, to slam the door and say, I'm not gonna work with you, that's wrong. Because you have to work with um, Mary Franklin and Women Survivors of Homicide Movement because these are our people. And um, we're going to do nothing but get bigger and better. We want these murders solved. Do you think they care? I would say they do care. I, I believe that this has been allowed for so long that it's almost new. Um, I'm sure they were very shocked when we first came on the scene, our organization. Here's this group of black women finally stepping up and, and saying, hello, we're here now. 
We want these murders solved, and guess what? We want to help you solve them. That had to be very shocking, and um, I'm sure they had to shift and adjust. But at some point, when are you going to allow us in and we can really work together? You know, this is an election year here in the city of Boston, and I have not heard uh, one mayoral candidate speak on unsolved homicides, nor have I heard any of the city councilors, um, especially District 7, which is in Roxbury, that has the highest amount of unsolved homicides. I have not heard one of those candidates talk about a comprehensive plan or what are they going to do to address these murders. When, when, over not, when approximately 95% of the people that are voting for them are impacted by murder and unsolved murder. And I would just, uh, just let me say, Commissioner Evans or anyone from the police department, if you all want to come on the Yellow Jacket Lady Show, by all means tweet me at Melanie Morris TV. I'm here every Monday night at 7.30 and I'd be more than happy to uh, discuss this further and hear your side of the story if there's more to be told, if there's more to be told. All right, we've just got, I know it goes by so fast, we've got about two minutes left. Sure. You, uh, tell us about your mayoral candidate yes. run or your bid yes. or what you were trying to do. Uh, yes, I had quickly, I had uh, jumped in the race. I, I always say I threw my stilettos in the race and seriously um, ran for mayor of the city of Boston. I was a candidate doing very well for over a year and a half. Um, but ballot time came and I wasn't able to get all the signatures that I needed. Um, not because people didn't want to sign. I really didn't have the um, woman or manpower I needed. So I missed by a few hundred, but that's okay. Um, unsolved homicides has always been my heart and will always be, yes. Well, congratulations, Thank even you. for throwing your stilettos in. Thank I love you. that comment, by the way, throwing you. your stilettos oh, in. Yes, yes. And you know what? Maybe in the future you'll well, run again. You never know. Yeah, yeah, we you never, never know. know. You never know. Uh, one more time before we leave, your event that's going on June 24th. Tell us when and where. Sure, and I will say this when we move back to the mayor release. Uh, City Councilor Rosendale looks real nice, too. So our <laughs> event is, again, um, the Purple Light Night Walk, which is on Saturday, June 24th. We're meeting at 7 o'clock at the Franklin Park Zoo entrance. We will walk down Blue Hill Avenue to the Mattapan Police Department, where we'll raise the unsolved homicide awareness flag, have some great food, and catch up to this data, really start getting this data in order, get it corrected that we can solve some of these murders. Wonderful. And give your phone number one sure. more time just in case. Sure. It's 857-600-1623. And we have a Facebook page, which is Women Survivors of Homicide Movement. Please check us out. Please like us also. Yes, yes, yes. Again, I've been to their Facebook page, and it is phenomenal. Uh, and going back to the walk, I mean, even if you have not lost a loved one, you can still come out and support. Yes. Um, I mean, everyone's lost a loved one at some point or another, whether it's to murder or sickness or disease. So we all know just losing a loved one, yes. period, is just so difficult. Yes. Definitely, definitely very difficult. To have somebody tragically murdered, and now it's an unsolved case. And so even if you have not had someone who's tragically murdered, still come out um, mm -hmm. June 24th, 7 p.m., the entrance of Franklin Park? Yes, the at entrance, the zoo entrance. The yes. zoo entrance mm -hmm. of Franklin Park. So come on out and, and maybe you can volunteer or maybe you can meet sure. Mary, give her a two thumbs up, tell her great job and see how you can volunteer to help this. So, you know, as I was just saying a little while ago, everybody has lost somebody, whether it's, you know, to cancer, a disease or a murder. Um, and you were going to yes. say something about right. that. You know, one of the things um, how I got involved in this work was I lost my husband 20 years ago. I sought out services, and there were no services for widows. Everything was mothers who lost their sons to murder. So I didn't fit in, and I kept asking myself, well, where do I go? What, what do I do? And that is why I created Melvin's Mission. Melvin's Mission Day program supporting women survivors of homicide. You know, for years, we've been so separated. It's always been moms who lost their sons. And no um, disrespect to that. Um, you know, they're worthy of um, having that category. But we have to understand this is a broader situation. 
you have wives who lost husbands, you have uh, mothers who lost brothers and uh, sisters who lost brothers and uh, uh, female next door neighbors. Look at Melvin, he used to always help out a uh, female neighbor next door. So that makes her a survivor. Survivors are a multitude and a variety of women. So. I hope that my organization was and continues to be able to break down those walls and to break down that, that ugly barrier that keeps us so separated. Well, that's amazing. There were no services for you as no. a widow, no. as a widow, and yeah. that's why you started yes. your first organization. And I think as women, that brings us all together as one group in one unit. We have the same thing in common, but we lost different people in our families. You know. Now, did you ever get any leads, any leads on Melvin's murder? As far as Melvin's murder is concerned, um, he was coming home from work one night. Mel always drove to work. This day he didn't drive his car. I was home getting the kids ready for bed. I heard two shots. Believe it or not, that was normal in the neighborhood. I, it's the truth. It was normal. I kept hearing the sirens. I started hearing the fire trucks. And th what I said to myself was, gee, someone, someone probably got murdered. I get a phone call from um, Boston Medical Center. Then it was called uh, Boston City Hospital. And they told me to quickly get to the hospital that Melvin was there. I wasn't sure what was wrong. I thought maybe he was in a car accident or he's okay. And I'm j I just need to go pick him up. I quickly woke my children up, rushed them into the car. And I didn't understand I was driving past his crime scene. Um, and I got to the hospital, uh, never forget it. I had one child, one hand here and a child here. And I remember the nurse um, very insensitively saying to me, he's expired. Um, and I also remember walking into a room with my two small children, no one there to say, let me take the kids and they don't need to see this. As we stood there and looked at Mel's um, body still warm, with a dry tear uh, down his face, tubes everywhere. Um, it was traumatizing. It will forever be traumatizing. It yeah. sounds, sounds very, very traumatizing. Yeah. Now, I read an article that he may have been intervening in a robbery. What, there, what I've heard also is someone was being robbed. Uh, Mel's presence walking up the street uh, interfered with the robbery. The person that was being robbed, gave, that gave them a chance to run. And they ran quickly, um, and Melvin became the victim. Melvin was shot twice. He was robbed um, just three or four houses down from our home. Three or four houses down. So the yes. person who got away, or the person who was initially being robbed, right. who ran, never, never came, came forward. forward. You know, and even if I could take a moment to ask that person if they're watching, you know, sure. look um, right into the camera. You know, wh whoever you are, you were there on October 15th, 1996. Um, a wonderful man took your place. Um, he gave his life for you. I would ask that you would call the Boston Police Department and give that information. It was 88 Woodrow Avenue, October 15th, 1996. If you're not comfortable doing that, you can call me, 857 600 one six two three. Melvin has children that he never saw grow up. He has grandchildren that he will never ever see, kiss, smell, or change their diaper. It's been 20 years, so I'm asking you to come forward now and give us some solid information so that my family can have justice. So that her family can have justice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again for joining us tonight, Mary Thank you. Franklin. For Thank me. you very much. Your wealth it. of information and your organization. You're just doing great things Thank within you. the community. So, Thank you so much. keep up, keep up the great work. Keep Thank up you. the great work. Again, I'm Melanie Morris, folks, a lady in the yellow jacket. Thanks for joining me tonight, and we'll see you next Monday. Good night.